Hello and welcome to Infection Control PowerPoint. In this, we're going to talk a little bit about how we can prevent infection, why it's important, um, universal precautions, standard precautions, and things of that nature. So the first thing we're going to talk about is preventing infection. So it's important to know infection is a major threat and health hazard in all of our healthcare um, facilities. So this is something that occurs no matter where you work, and it's always going to be a threat. So how we, what we do um, to prevent infection is going to be really important. Everyone is at risk from the staff to the patients to the vis visitors. That's why it's important that we follow these things called universal precautions, standard precautions, and it's important to understand how the immune system plays a major role in preventing the spread of infection. So the first thing we're going to get into is universal precautions. What universal precautions is, is it's an approach and to basically sum it up is we are assuming Everybody we come into contact with has an infectious disease. So it's never an assumption or um, guessing, oh, this person does, maybe that person doesn't. It's an, we are assuming that every single person we come across has an infectious disease. Therefore, we have to protect ourselves and everyone around us. So within universal precautions, there's standard precautions. What standard precaution it, precautions are, are a set of infection control practices we use to prevent the transmission of diseases and infections, all right? And that's through those are spread through contact with bodily fluids. We are going to use these standard precautions anytime we're providing care to any individual, all right? Whether they seem to... Um, appear to have some type of disease or illness or infection or not. But once again, universal precautions, we're always assuming they are infectious. So when it comes to standard precautions, it's always important that we wash our hands. It's the most important thing we can do to stop the spread of infection. Once again, or consider every person potentially infectious, and that is sta including staff and the patient. We are going to make sure we wash our hands before we put on gloves and immediately after we remove gloves. We should always wear gloves when we're going to come in contact with bodily fluids. Bodily fluids are going to consist of blood, urine, saliva, sputum, drainage, feces, semen, vaginal secretions, vomit, broken skin, or mucous membranes. This includes anything wet, any soiled instruments, or contaminated waste materials. So obviously, as phlebotomy um, technicians, we're going to be dealing with bodily fluids constantly, constantly because we'll be collecting blood. We should also wear gloves prior to performing any invasive procedure, including blood draws, and we want to make sure we remove gloves immediately when we're finished with that procedure. If for any reason blood ever comes contact with our skin surfaces, we want to make sure that we immediately wash all the skin surfaces that have, have been contaminated by that bodily fluid. So stop what you're doing and go immediately wash. We want to carefully bag all contaminated supplies. This is going to be really important for you to know. We are never going to recap any needles or sharps after we use them. Now, most needles, most blood draw needles, most um, injections, anything that involves a needle nowadays tends to have safety device on them that um, either retracts the needle so it can't accidentally stick yourself or anyone else, so therefore you wouldn't have to recap it. Um, there's ones that have shields that slide over the needle, once again, so you can't accidentally hurt yourself. Um, this is the number one thing that happens. You know, you're going to see a lot of people who accidentally stick themselves, accidentally, um, you know, hurt themselves with the needle. So it's always important to be extremely cautious when you have the needle out, when you're using needles or any types of sharps. You don't have to worry about the shaving a residence, so we're just going to sort of skip over that. However, you will be 
labeling specimens. Obviously, we will be drawing blood, and that is a bodily fluid that's a um, specimen. We're going to get into labeling in a different PowerPoint, so I'm going to sort of just touch base on the basics. It's important that we have the name of the patient that we drew the blood from, their date of birth, if it's inpatient, the room number, the date and time it was um, the sample was taken as well. And then it should always be put in a lab specimen bag or biohazard bag. It's also important that any equipment um, we use, any contaminated waste, we're um, disposing of them the proper way, making sure you're following your facility's policy. So hand washing. Remember, this is the most important way we can prevent the spread of infection. It requires us to use antimicrobial soap to remove, kill, or inhibit any microorganisms. It's great to wash your hands for one to two min minutes is the proper amount of time. So please stop. Take your time. Once again, this is the best way you can stop the spread of infection. Once again, I don't want to take, I want to, I don't want to um, spread an infection to myself, take it home to my family, and especially not to another patient. So make sure you're washing your hands properly. So it's important we should wash our hands when you first arrive at work, anytime your hands are visibly soiled, before, between, and after all contact with any patient, before putting on gloves and after removing gloves, after contact with any bodily fluids, after handling contaminated items, after contact with any object in the residence room, um, before and after touching meal trays, if you were able to help with that, um, if you were to help with feeding, which that's not something you'll really be doing as a phlebotomy technician at all. Um, if you're getting any linen, though, or any um, clean gauze or sponges or anything like that, that's stuff you should already have prepared. So, um, Make sure you have that if you're before and after using the toilet. Obviously, if you're touching the garbage or trash can or any areas of the body and before leaving the facility. These are all important times on when you should wash your hands. So, how do we wash our hands, right? It seems like a simple task, but there's a special way that we should do this. Um, a proper way, I guess we, I should say, on how we should do this. So, the supplies that you need. Obviously, a sink to wash your hands at. Soap, paper towels, and a waste paper basket. So we're first obviously going to approach the sink, turn on the water, and adjust the temperature so it's warm. First thing we're going to do is wet our wrists and hands thoroughly with the water, making sure we're holding our hands downward. We want to make sure we do not flick. It's a bad habit we all have. All right, and just an FYI for you, we're going to be attaching a video to this section so you guys can go through and make sure you watch the hand washing video. It's something that we will check you off at at lab to make sure that you are doing this correctly. Once you've wet your hands and wrists thoroughly, you're then going to apply the soap and lather your hands while by rubbing your palms together, sort of lather that soap up. Um, you're going to wash your hands using friction and a rotating motion for a minimum of 20-30 seconds, but once again, we prefer one to two minutes to make sure you're doing it correctly. You're going to start, once you've lathered that up and we start using friction, by taking your fingernails and rubbing them against the opposite hand's palm and fingers, All right, going up and down using that friction. Then you are going to wash the palms, once again, using those fingernails and back of hand. So taking your hand, rotating the hand. You want to make sure you get your thumb. That's one thing that people forget. You're going to wash your fingers in a rotation type motion. So it's important that you get the side of the hand and the side of the pinky. That's an easily for, um, forgotten spot that does carry a lot of germs. Getting in between the fingers all the way up to the fingertip around the fingernails and the cuticles, all right? Making sure you get every finger, including the thumb. You want to make sure you wash, wash at least two inches of your wrist in a circular motion. Once again, you can see this exactly in the video. Then we're going to rinse our hands well, making sure we do not flick. What flicking does is when you start flicking the water off your hands, what you're really doing is spreading bacteria, especially when you do that prior to washing your hands. Then what we're going to do is we're going to pat wrists and hands dry from the fingertips to the wrist. So when you're using the piece of paper, 
you're going to grab a piece of paper towel and you're going to start at your fingertips and work your way down to your wrists. You're going to do one hand, then the other. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take a dry piece of paper towel and turn off the water. The reason why we use a dry piece of paper towel is because bacteria and germs can go through a, a paper towel that's wet, through that moist environment, it can go through that. So using a dry piece of paper towel will allow you to keep your hands clean. Making sure all the paper towels have already been in the wastebasket, and if for some reason you touch the sink or the faucet um, or anything while you're washing your hands, just start over so you can make sure you're getting all of the bacteria and germs off. All right, the next is donning gloves, which also which, which means putting on your gloves. So obviously we're going to wash our hands before we put on our gloves. If you're right-handed, you're going to slide one glove on your left hand. Then using your glove hand, slide the other one into the second glove. All right, so now your gloves are on both hands. Make sure all your fingers are in the correct hole within the hand within the glove. Then interlace your fingers to smooth out any folds and to keep, create a comfortable fit. You want to make sure you carefully look for any tears or holes or discolored spots on or in the gloves. All right. The whole reason we're putting these on is because we're about to deal with bodily fluids. The last thing you want is a tear or a hole in there. So just do a quick check. It shouldn't take long at all. Just a few seconds. If you're um, in an area that has precautions, which we'll get into later, um, if there's a gown that you have to put on, make sure the glove is pulled over the cuff of the of um the sleeve of the gown. Removing gloves. So what we're going to do is we're going to take with one hand, we're going to pinch the palm of the glove. All right, we're not going underneath. Our glove shouldn't be touching the skin. We're just pinching the glove. And what we're going to do is um, pull it up and over our hand, turning it inside out. All right, then what we're going to do, with, and we're going to then ball it up in our gloved hand, in the next one, we're going to take our our finger, pointer finger, our thumb, and go over, or excuse me, go under the glove at the wrist and pull it inside out. So what you're going to see here in the next slide is I'm going to show you pictures so you get a really good visual. Sometimes this can get confusing just trying to explain it with words. So um, we'll give you that visual. It is important. Remember to wash your hands immediately after removing gloves. Here's the visual, as you can see in the first step, we're pinching the glove at the bottom of the palm, not going underneath, it's not touching the skin, it's just pinching near the palm. Then you're pulling it off inside out and balling it up into your gloved hand. And then as you can see with the index finger, they're reaching underneath the glove. So that way they're not touching the outside, only the inside and pulling it inside out. That way you do not con contaminate your hands. You're not touching the outside of the gloves with your skin at any time. Personal protective equipment. So this is something we also is known as PPE. So personal protective equipment, PPE. And it's used when there could be um, splashing or spraying of any bodily fluids or blood um, could occur. This is also used when somebody is on any type of isolation precautions, um, meaning they have some type of infection that is easily spread. So we wanna make sure we're protecting ourselves and the other patients by adding additional equipment. This can include, personal protective equipment can include gloves, gown, goggles, and mask. So in order to put PPE on, we're going to wash our hands, we're going to put the gown on, mask, goggles, and then gloves. When we go to remove it, we're going to put the gloves on, then the goggles, then the gown, then the mask, and if there's a cap, you would put the cap on, and then lastly, wash your hands. So once again, excuse me, I meant, I think I said on, I meant off. So gloves, goggles, gown, mask, cap, that's the order you would take them off. We always want to take the thing that's dirtiest off first, and that would be the gloves. All right. That's why we remove those first. Once again, these are some of the things that can be considered personal protective equipment, mask, goggles, face shields, and respirator.
isolation precautions. Isolation means that we're separated. There's the separation of an infection source from susceptible hosts, thereby breaking the chain of infection. So the Center for Disease Control recommends universal precautions, which we talked about earlier. And remember, universal and standard precautions should always be used. Just because somebody's on isolation doesn't mean we don't use those two things and only use PPE. All right. There's we always may add PPE to the universal and standard precautions. based precautions. They're the second tier of precautions. They're used when the patient is known or suspected of being infected with a contagious disease. Once again, we're going to use these on top of or in addition to universal precautions and standard precautions. Most importantly, the utmost care should be used with regard to a patient and employees crucial. So with contact precautions, all right, so this is one of the many types of precautions. This means that an infectious agent is transmitted directly or indirectly from one infected person to a susceptible host, often on the contaminated hands of a healthcare worker, all right? That's how easy it can be spread. Some examples of why somebody would be on contact precautions, the two most common are going to be MRSA and C. diff. But some of these ones are um, other options. But MRSA and C. diff are the two most common you're going to see in, in um, facilities. And that is why somebody may be on contact precautions. It's important we're wearing gown and gloves when somebody is in contact precautions. Those are the two things that you need. So gloves and gown, no matter what. Before you enter the room, this is something you're going to be putting on. You'll be wearing clean, non-sterile exam gloves when entering the room. Make sure you change gloves after contact with infective material and remove gloves before leaving the patient room, including the gown. Droplet precautions are used for individuals who can pass infection through coughing, sneezing, talking, um, and procedures such as suctioning. Some reasons why... Um, some people may be on droplet precautions are pertussis, influenza, diphtheria, and invasive meningitis. You should wear gloves and mask for droplet precautions. So gloves and mask for droplet. Airborne, for airborne precautions, um, this is when somebody is known to have or suspect of having a disease transmitted by airborne droplet nuclei. All right, so these are some pretty severe things that people are going to have. This you're only going to see in the hospital. Um, measles, SARS, varicella, um, TB. So once again, airborne precautions applies to patients nor are suspected of having any of these. You're going to be wearing gloves and then either an N95 respirator or a PAPR, Powered Air Purifying Respirator. And these are masks that have to be um, customized and um individualized fitted to you individually fitted to you so um these are specialized masks they're not the regular mask you're used to seeing um somebody put on um it's important that the patients be put in a um airborne infection isolation room and basically what this does it's a negative pressure room um and it exchanges um the air at least a minimum of six times per hour um and it's ventilated in a different way so it doesn't go through the hospital or into any other areas um, directly to the outside through a, spe a specific um, filtration system called the HEP, excuse me, the HEPA. If this is not available, then the patient should be provided with a face mask and placed in immediately in an exam room with a closed door. However, almost every hospital I've ever been in has these rooms, all right, these AIIR rooms. All right, so let's talk about the immune system a little bit because the immune system is what um, is in charge of, it's our defense system. It's what's in charge of defending or protecting our body, all right? So this is what's protecting us from infections and other things. So there's two types of infection, localized and systemic. 
Localized infection, this is one that all of you have probably had. It is limited to a specific location in the body. Say you fall and cut your knee, and then all of a sudden it starts to get infected. So you have a little cut on your knee, and then you'll notice that maybe it's painful to the touch. That it's really red. It's swollen. There might be pus or drainage coming out of it, and it's hot to the touch. All right, that's a localized infection. Now, a systemic infection is a little different, a lot different. It affects the entire body. So different things, if you ever heard of somebody um, going septic or being in sepsis, all right, that's a systemic infection. It affects the entire body, multiple organ systems, multiple or more, multiple organs, multiple systems it's affecting. Some signs and symptoms of a systemic infection include fever, body aches, chills, nausea, vomiting, weakness, headache, mental confusion, um, and drop in per a person's normal blood pressure. So how is infection spread? Through hands, blood, food, fluids, dressings, meaning wound dressings, all right, contaminated equipment or utensils. This is why import it's important that we clean up. Um, we disinfect our equipment. We don't reuse equipment. Insects and animals. These are all ways that infection can be spread. So it can enter the body through respiratory by inhaling, through ingesting, so eating, through blood or breaks in the skin. It's able to exit, so infection can exit the body through respiratory by coughing, sneezing, or any airborne droplets through the blood. The most common types of infections are staph infection, strep infestation, so scabies, MRSA, and C. diff. These are the, MRSA and C. diff are the two main ones you're going to see, all right? MRSA is sort of like a super bug that is, um, takes some high-dose antibiotics to, um, to get rid of that infection. C. diff is an infection that's within the intestines and the colon, and what it causes is like a mucousy diarrhea um, Ironically, it's caused by antibiotics, but cured by antibiotics. Um, so those are the two most common ones that you are going to see. So what's required for growth? How does this infection, this bacteria grow? You have to have a person or a host, right? Moisture, warmth, darkness nourishment, and oxygen. This is everything that it needs to grow. So if we can eliminate any of these or all of these, that is the best possible thing we can do to stop that growth from occurring. So why are patients more susceptible to infection? They have a compromised immune system. The elderly especially, um, the aging process just breaks down the immune system. But even somebody who's sick in the hospital has a compromised immune system. They're already working on fighting off whatever sickness or issues going on with them at that time. Um, there's common problems that predispose um, patients to infection, chronic illnesses, poor nutrition and dehydration, which many, many, many patients have. Usually when you're sick, you're not eating and drinking a lot. You're not hungry. You know, you don't want to eat and drink. So this is um, leads to that poor nutrition and dehydration. You're stressed. You're tired when you're when you're sick, especially if you're in the hospital setting, right? So this is important that we try to, um, you know, understand why and how, how easy it is for infection to spread, especially in places um, like the hospital, nursing home, and other places like that. So it's important to know infection prevention. This is a set of methods practiced in the healthcare facilities to prevent and control the spread of infection. Those standard precautions, meaning we're treating all those bodily fluids and mucous membranes. Hand washing, universal precautions, isolation, chemical disinfectation, infection, excuse me, disinfection, um, making sure we're cleaning our equipment and handling our equipment, linen, food, waste products, bodily fluids the way that we should. And if we're ill or infected, we're making sure we're not caring for residents or patients. And we sort of went over the signs and symptoms, but systemic infections, you're going to have fever, anorexia, meaning that they're not going to be hungry, they're fatigued. Local is going to be redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, 
and um, drainage going on. So that's the difference between the two. Um, inflammation, not the difference between the two. Those are the different symptoms between the two. Remember, systemic is the entire body. Localized is one specific area, like a cut on your knee. So different diseases we're going to discuss. AIDS, hepatitis B, TB or tuberculosis, MRSA, C. diff, and nosocomial infection. So all the ones I just listed are infectious diseases. The first one we're going to talk about are AIDS. AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome and is called by a virus called human immunodeficiency virus, also known as HIV. AIDS is transmitted by blood, vaginal fluids, and semen. It is not spread through casual contact. AIDS may also be transmitted through the blood and infected person that enters another person's bloodstream through a, a cut, an open sore, or blood that is splashed into the mouth or eye. Okay, that's another way that it can be Hepatitis B is another one, and this is called by an inflammation of the liver that is caused by the hepatitis virus, also known as HBV. OSHA states that all employers must provide the hepatitis B vaccine for all employees who have an occupational employer risk. That's why if any of you are going to nursing school, work in a hospital or anything like that, you have to get that hepatitis B vaccine or sign off on a waiver if you choose not to. Tuberculosis, also known as TB, this is caused by mycobacterium um, tuberculosis, which is an airborne pathogen. Health workers that come into contact with patients who have TB must wear that PPE, and that's the one like the N95 mask or the PAPR mask that has to be customized and individually fit to you. MRSA, all right, so MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's an infection. It is caused by a type of staph bacteria that's become resistant to many of the antibiotics that we treat ordinary staph infections, all right? So it's like a super staph infection. The, sta um, this, the skin infections generally start as swollen, painful red bumps. Um, they sort of might resemble things like pimples or spider bites. Um, but what you might also see are things uh, might become warm to the touch, full of pus or other drainage, and may be accompanied by a fever. So it takes stronger antibiotics to cure this. This is something that you're going to see very often um, in different facilities. MRSA is just a common infection. C. diff right here. All right, so C. diff is something that you're going to see a lot of as well. So this is a bacterium that can cause symptoms ranging from diarrhea to life-threatening inflammation of the colon. Typically occurs after the use of antibiotic medications, but ironically, once again, antibiotics are what's going to cure it. It's just a higher doses or more um, potent anti antibiotic. So symptoms include watery diarrhea three or more times a day for two or more days, mild abdominal cramping and tenderness, rapid heart rate, fever, dehydration, and swollen abdomen. So nosocomial infections is an infection or any, any infection that first occurs during a patient stay at a healthcare facility, whether that's a hospital, nursing home, anything, any healthcare facility, regardless of whether it was detected during the stay or after. So any infection that occurs um, when a patient has had a stay at a healthcare facility, whether it was detected while they were in the hospital or once they left. These infections are usually transmitted to the patient by a healthcare worker, so by staff members. This is why these um, infection control measures, the universal precautions, the stand precautions are so important. Once again, our patients have that compromised immune system. So proper hand washing techniques are the best method to prevent the spread of infection, especially the nosocomial infections. Also known, um, you might also hear them as hospital-acquired infection, HAI, or healthcare-associated infection, HCAI.
So infection control is based on the fact that the transmission of infectious diseases will be will be prevented or stopped when any level isn't of the chain is broken or interrupted, okay? What is included in this chain, all right? Agents, portal of exit, mode of transmission, portal of entry, susceptible horse, and reservoir. So I'll show you a visual just so you get a So here's a visual of the chain of infection. So we have our susceptible ho horse, no, susceptible host, all right? We have an infectious agent, a reservoir, a portal of exit, mode of transmission, and a portable, a port portal of entry. All right, so these are our chain of So our infectious agent, so we're going to talk about first. Agents are infect infectious microorganisms that can be classified into groups. Things like viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. It is these agents that cause disease, okay? So our infectious agents. Portal of exit. So this is um, a method by which an infectious agent leaves its reservoir. So some examples are the nose, hands, sneezing can be said, all can be considered portals of exit. So ways that it can leave the body, right? So where, it, or the reservoir, where it's located. Mode of transmission, all right? So this is the method of transfer. So there's five main top types. There's contact, whether it be direct or indirect. There's droplet, which we've talked about. There's airborne. There's a common vehicle, and there's vector, vector borne. So I want to highlight a little bit more. The first thing um, I want to highlight would be common vehicle. All right, the co communication vehicle, um, excuse me, the common vehicle is spread and defined in many different ways. The most commonly described its transmission would be through things like um, food, water, drugs, blood products, and any medical devices. Vector-borne, these diseases are infections transmitted by living organisms. This will be something like, um, includes bites of an infected organism, such as a mosquito, a tick, sand flies, black flies, things of that nature. Then we have the portal of entry. This is an opening allowing the microorganism to enter the host. So these portals include body orifices, mucous membranes, or any breaks in the skin. It's the way that these infections or microorganisms can enter the body. Portals also result from tubes placed in body cavities, such as catheters, um, any punctures, for instance, us drawing bloods. Uh, drawing blood and IV being put in or replaced, okay? So this is these are all portals of entry. Lastly, the susceptible host, a person who cannot resist a microorganism invading the body, multiplying or resulting infection. The host is susceptible disease, so they're lacking the immunity or any physical resistance to come over the invasion um, by that microorganisms. So once again, most of our patients are more susceptible to infection because their body's already fighting. It's compromised at this time. Hence ans ans answering this question right here, who are more susceptible. So what's good aseptic te technique for proper blood collection? It's important. We are always, always washing our hands and we're washing them frequently. We are using a barrier um, and using PPE, so personal protective equipment. We're making sure we're using good, proper waste management of contaminated materials, proper cleaning solutions, and cleaning when we should. We're following standard precautions, and we're using sterile procedures when necessary. This is how we should make sure we, we help prevent the spread infection as phlebotomy technicians.